I am Karan Bajaj. I'm the founder of Whitehead Junior, which was acquired by Bajus. So you may also know of my work as a novelist and may have read some of my novels. Great to meet you. Ek minute, ruk jao. Ready hone do. Chalo. Ye kar lete hain. This could be a great intro. <laughs> I'd always fantasized about like living in Mongolia due to some reason and I was like look if I'm not going to do it now I'm going to never going to do it so I spent two months in Mongolia or Central Asia including uh, then Mongolia Bhutan etc then I always had a dream of backpacking through Europe that everybody had at that point of time because of the movies and stuff so I packed back through eastern Europe not western Europe but Hungary Romania etc and then I uh, again was pulled to south america so i lived in south america so for two months each i backpacked through central asia eastern europe and then uh, south america so that was the six month kind of time off i took i left my job to do it and then i came back to my worst case scenario <laughs> which is a different story <laughs> what But is that like <laughs> like like this again you go for these kind of things right uh, the world tells you to follow your dream etc you feel kind of like cautiously optimistic right and i thought it was kind of a bit of my dream to kind of travel and write a bit and then i Like the, back to world of your alchemist. Yeah, right? totally yeah. alchemist. That the world will, you know, like converge to your interest and all that stuff. So look, I went in April two thousand eight. Is where I left Procter and Gamble. At that time, the U.S. economy was at its peak. So mm-hmm. the feeling I had was that look, I'll come back. Uh, I, I'll lock the doors for a job and I'll find a job. But I came back in October two thousand eight on the day Lehman Brothers collapsed. So I came back to the U.S. I reacted on the day Lehman Brothers collapsed. and it was shocking basically everything dried out i somewhat misplanned my finances i had some like obviously savings uh, but i was so optimistic about finding a job that i pretty much like like i backpack in my backpacking i kind of you know used up uh, like a majority of my money so when i came back there were like no jobs i was in my sister's apartment sleeping on a couch in the living room she had two small kids and i was like really uh, i was living the worst case i had no job like i was 29 i was 20, i was just touching 30 at that point because i'd left at age 29 at age 30 i had like basically no job no money i was sleeping on my sister's couch a relationship had broken then my mother had cancer at the same time due to adding up to the problem like you know to the things that were happening that time she had serious like stage 4 cancer detected at the same time so pretty much i was broke unemployed no job prospects and i just lived my worst case scenario after the 6 month trip and then i obviously frantically applied and uh, eventually got a job in the boston consulting group because they were the only ones uh, like mckinsey and bcg the only ones hiring for cost cutting projects right like during the 2008 crisis so i i felt like i had <laughs> i'd like uh, gone back a decade <laughs> so yeah so then what like uh, you then were- i applied frantically for a job and uh, got into bcg again unknowingly very good thing happened i think if i had come back to the polo coelho world where i was an enlightened soul who had just accelerated in my career then i would have been i guess i would have gone through this cycle of like understanding i think then was the first time that understanding kind of started to seep in that look wherever you chase an extraordinary growth experience you are going to have a miserable time in the short term and a very positive time in the long term very very good learning shaped in because see, what happened after that is that 3 4 months of pretty much hell then i got a job at bcg which i basically hated i didn't like the bcg job at all and i was like kind of pretty much like a miserable consultant who was doing excel files etc again as i said my dharma was never go excel files presentation i was an operator executor creative soul so i felt like completely uh, like you know just very completely fully stifled in bcg and then but during that time i was working on my novel keep of the grass i finished it uh, If the novel released it did quite well at that point of time for india 2008 it did quite well 
it was about like traveling and uh, backpacking and drugs and stuff, which was a uh, somewhat different theme for India at that point of time. And it did really, without much marketing, it became like quite a, like a success in ca college campuses that people were starting to read it. And so then eventually with BCG also, I think I had a, a sudden kind of enlightenment and more moment where I said that, look, it's a short term. I just have to learn a lot. And I think the moment my focus shifted from this is a dead end career to I'm just going to learn a lot for the short term, which I think again became a very important paradigm in my life that I just got to learn everything I can. Again, I think I had a very positive experience at BCG because I was like, look, I'm never going to learn how to manipulate and access database again or do array formulas in Excel. So let me just quiet down and learn that. And I think the moment my focus shifted to learning again, I had a pleasant experience in the job. So I think some paradigms that really happened helped later, which is that growth is going to suck in the short term deliver results in the long term. Second, just focus everywhere on what can you learn rather than what can you achieve and you'll do well. Those paradigms really helped me later. And if I had a smooth sailing after re-entry and like got back to a job at PNG and done very well, etc., I don't think I would have learned those lessons that really helped me later to make big moves. Yeah. So did you find your dharma? Like BCG was obviously not your dharma. Yeah. With BCG, I was just looking out all the time, like kaise bahar niklu, and I was uh, waiting for the recession to get over. And again, 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 my learning was that when you're not in your therma, don't worry about ki resume mein kitna duration hai. Because I think the 18 months or so I spent in BCG was reasonably miserable. I did reasonably well after I started to go on the learning paradigm. But if I'd moved out earlier, it would not have hurt me. But then I went back to brand management. That was what I knew was my dharma. So I went back to brand management after that. And uh, like I last consulting client was Kraft in BCG. And they kind of got me in. So I, I just took it. Again, yeah. in the US only? In the US, I was in uh, New York. Then I think after the first novel, writing became more important to me. I wrote my second novel, Johnny Gone Down, which again did quite well. And I, that in fiction and uh, that, that did, uh, that did uh, quite well, like movie, like, uh, it was kind of a lot of movie options and eventually Ronnie Skubala bought it for a movie and stuff. So it, it did really well. And I started to feel, look, I really like this act of actually not just writing, but this act of doing extraordinary things which are in accordance with what I want to do, like traveling, backpacking, etc. And then writing about it in a either a fictional construct sort of a thing, right? So then I really wanted to move to New York City. So I, at the moment I got a job with Kraft, Starbucks, I, I think I got a bunch of jobs at that point of time. I chose Kraft to live in New York City and I wanted to live in New York City and really get very good as an artist. I really wanted to explore the artist side of my career. And, and I think then it started a pleasant phase, I think, at the Kraft in New York where I Almost started to like do 50, like I realized that the job kind of world is like you just show up and you do like, you know, it, it, and I spent like about 50% of my time almost on my writing and trying to make my writing much better. I wanted to write a, the third novel I got very ambitious about. I was like, keep off the grass, Johnny Gondon have done reasonably well in India, but this is a small pond in which I'm doing what I know. So I wanted to write a novel which would stand the test of time, like Ernest Hemingway or all the books that I was reading at that time. I read very widely when I came to New York. I read very deeply. I was reading books and I was feeling very minor as a writer. I felt like I had not accomplished anything. So I wanted to write a novel that would really stand the test of time. So I think that became almost my obsession at that point of time while my job was going on in parallel. Were you like taking writing workshops? Yeah, I did everything. So I did writing workshops in New York. Uh, like there were Gotham writing workshops. I did a lot of writing workshops in New York, joined writing groups, then read every book possible on the art of writing. That And that again became a, like like in Buddhism, there is this concept called Sharana Manana Nididhyana, which is to master any subject. First, you need to read and listen as much as you can through secondary sources, then reflect, follow, form your own thesis. And then experience, which is this kind of experience, that subject. And that how learning will sink in. So again, I didn't know it consciously at that point of time, but I was reading and listening a lot about how to be a good writer, reflecting on my own uh, like journey as a writer and then uh, 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 writing. And that took up, I would say, half of my life during the craft New York phase. Yeah. Yeah. So did you write the great novel that you wanted to write? I would say I wrote the best novel that I was capable of writing. And again, I, after that, I never wrote fiction again, uh, because so I think I let craft only that while, while at craft, I started to write, but then I really wanted to deep dive. So I took a year off, like after craft. Uh, and as I said, the first year off, it made me stronger, you know, like it's an important thing to do. You learn tremendously. And so at that point of time, several things were happening. I think three things were happening, but I was getting very deep into my writing. So I wanted to have an extended period of time to just write full time. I wanted to be a full time writer. Second, uh, 
my mother who had cancer in 2008, she was going through a dramatic decline. So I took some time off from craft again to be with her in her last moments. And I think she was very close to me and her, like her decline from cancer was very dramatic and, and like, you know, like her body really withered away. And I, I had all these, like, I was always interested in Buddhism, yoga, etc. But all of it came rushing to the surface. And I really wanted to, I, I really wanted to, let me put it this way. I really wanted to get a glimpse of what enlightenment looked like. What is the nature of suffering? So I wanted to take an extended period of time to just deep dive into yoga and meditation. With, with, with a, not with a goal of productivity or career, but almost like a monk like I wanted to glimpse why does suffering happen. That like was very important to me. So I think that was the second thing that happened. And the third thing that happened was, I just felt like this career thing is like, but it's nothing, right? Tom, like you, you go and work and you come back and you, like, it's not going to add up to, like, I, I, which was the feeling I always, like, I was starting to have at the last days of Procter Gamble. Again, I was starting to feel the same way that this is not going to add up to life, uh, right? Like, just like, this is not going to build some legacy for me here. So I... So I think with that thrust in mind, I think I took the next time off. This was a much longer, I took one year off. And uh, with this one year off, like my girlfriend and I, we went from Europe to India by road, like really living very barely from reached India, then did the yoga teachers training. But basically the kind of the general path was to take the cheapest mode of transport available, which could be walking, bus, ferry, bus, bus, bus uh, yeah. like, uh, you know, like in some form of you know, hiking as much as we could, whatever was practical live in hostels and stuff. The idea was somewhat, I, I like this stoic idea of uh, willful poverty that you have to teach your mind, your body to live with the least it can live with. with uh, like, you know, teach your mind willful poverty, uh, your body, your mind willful poverty so that your uh, choices become very authentic because you'll try to make a choice less and less. It will never be perfect, right? Obviously, we grew up with a certain conditioning where stability, etc. was important. But you were t I was trying to teach my mind to look, make authentic choices, right? Don't, don't join a company. Uh, or or don't do a job because you think it's a stable job or a secure job. Try to che te teach your mind that you don't need enough. And I, and I think that helped me. Again, it might not be as perfect as uh, Seneca or whatever, but it helped me. Like it was a good stoic concept. So I, I had re read stoicism at that point of time. So this willful poverty concept helped me a lot. So I think the idea was that we would just choose willful poverty and it helped, right? Three, four months we uh, reached India with very like old backpacking cheap means. Then in India, the yoga teacher's training was very bare. Uh, there were 60 people in a dorm room, one bathroom, cold showers, I think very disciplined, very austere and disciplined environment. I think it really liberated me later. Uh, I would say later it liberated me because I genuinely started to believe at some level that I was, I could live with very little. I'll just do what I think is right for my life. And uh, so then I did yoga teacher training, did meditation, uh, Vipassana meditation, multiple three courses back to back, uh, the 10 day silent day retreat. So I did uh, three reasonably back to back. Then I went to Portugal and wrote my novel in an artist retreat. Again, very good experience for me because uh, for the first time I was becoming a full-time writer and came back to New York, became a full-time writer and finished my novel. So it took a long time to finish that novel. I started during the craft phase. It almost took me four or five years. And as I said, it was the best I was capable of, but not best by the world standards at all. So yeah. Yeah. So what was that uh, novel about? Like. It was called the Yoke of Max's Discontent uh, in the US, called The Seeker in India. I, what I really wanted to, what I was trying to do was to write a novel of spiritual enlightenment as a thriller. So uh, in the alchemist style, but truly a very fast paced thriller. And yet a novel in which uh, there was kind of deep, uh, not just like, I would say not hokey or not modern spiritual enlightenment, but the true like spiritual striving that the Buddha went through. But I wanted to write it as a thriller so that it was a page turning thriller. That was what I was trying to do. And I think I tried, I, I uh, you know, was reasonably successful at that from my own limits of my own ability. Random House published it worldwide, which was one of my ambitions that the top publishing house publishes it worldwide as an indicator of whether I had reached some kind of excellence. So I was rejected 50, 60 times. Uh, eventually Penguin Random House published it across the US, UK, across the world, multiple translations. So I felt like I'd achieved some level of like, I would say, excellence in this field. And then that's how, that's, yeah, that's what happened with the third novel. Did you continue the willful poverty once you like became published, this novel came out? Like, you know, did that become a way of life or was that a, a phase of discovering that, yes, I can live in poverty? In I think it was never a phase of discovery. I've never, like after that also, or before that also, I was never very materialistic. I think most people are like, I'm not extremely like, you know, like, I was, like there's nothing great, great about me that way, but I am like, which is, I, 
I've not, never been, I've never, for example, I think I'm at this age now, even after the startup exit, I've never bought any house every, anywhere. I've never owned a car. I've typically rented cars or taken Ubers. So I would say, I, I, I won't call it some very big spiritual principle as such, but I've like uh, generally not been full to materialism. I think the full poverty just gave us a, like, for example, I think my wife and I, we have two small kids now, six and four. Like we're very comfortable that uh, like uh, if I look at this pandemic, we live for four months in Goa, then we move to Sri Lanka, then we move to Costa Rica. We are living 12 months in Costa Rica and all of us are living out of like a backpack each, right? The four, two kids and because uh, we've just like kept moving every few months and it's got nothing to do with the money I have now or not, but I have like all of our family lives out of a backpack in a small two-room kind of house in Costa Rica in the hills, which we're very comfortable with doing. The kids are going to like a local Spanish school in Costa Rica. They didn't know Spanish before. So we're very comfortable with this idea of uprooting ourselves, knowing that we need very little to, very little, I would say, comfort and very little security around us and then executing that plan. So we are living in Costa Rica for this year very comfortably without, yeah. So I think it's become an enduring part of life to like to not seek too much certainty, stability, comfort. All of this comes from this idea that, look, I can pack up and move. All I need is the, like the backpack on my back. And, and, and the kids have grown up like that, which I think is very good. I guess that phase of willful poverty freed you from seeking financial return in your choices. You know, like most people are, I mean, everyone has that insecurity of finance. Like I, what if I don't have money? One way to fix that insecurity is to earn money and build a big bell bank balance and say, okay, I have one crore in my bank, so I don't need to be insecure. Or the other way is to say, even with 100 rupees a day, I'm okay, which is the path that you took. I took that path at that point of time, but I would also say that I had this dichotomy where once I returned from that sabbatical, came back to New York, took up a job again, rejoined Kraft, started to feel a very big uh, disconnect with my life that I was going towards uh, like the, I would say uh, some kind of a spiritual awakening that was happening, creative awakening that was happening. But then we got married, had kids at uh, that point of time. That point of time for the first time in my life, I started to think about the fact that I was never going to be breaking out of this cycle until I'd achieved uh, financial independence. I always felt now that I would be caught into a cycle where I would be working for a few years, then taking some time off. I would become 50 years old and start knocking for jobs again. I think the idea of financial independence became very important to me because of this very creative, spiritual life. I felt like, look, I, I had two kids now. I wanted to be a provider for them, but I knew that the writing, the creativity, the spirituality, these kind of chances are very important to my life. And I knew that the conventional structure of a job would never be able to allow me to do that. So actually the uh, idea of sp uh, financial independence took root and I had this 4% rule which is that whatever is the money that I need to live every year divided by 4% should be my net worth. And I felt I was very far from that. And I think that was actually like a moment in which I said, look, in order to achieve this 4% rule, I'll have to become being in a job will never allow me to accumulate this net worth. Give me an example of that 4% so rule. 4 rule. Yeah, so 4% rule. 4% rule would be that suppose uh, you say that like I need about two crores a year to live comfortably with that's where my kids can go to the best schools that I want them to go to, I can live comfortably. So 300,000 divided by 4% is $7.5 million, right? So uh, like, taking just one example, right? Obviously, if it's one crore, then it's three point, you divide it by, uh, you know, 3.75, whatever. So $7.5 million if you want two crores annually. So that 4% rule became uh, like, so at that point of time, whatever I uh, arrived at, like uh, say that I need $4 million or whatever. I knew that my current job, even though I was at that point disc discovery CEO, uh, discovery head in India, I knew that the job construct would never allow me to make $4 million or whatever that number was, uh, $7.5 million and net of taxes at the 4% rule. So then I was very convinced about it. Uh, yeah. How did craft to discovery happen? Yeah, so I came, I came back to craft. Uh, started to feel really disconnected with like, I guess what I was really, uh, I, I don't know what I was uh, awakening towards, right? I was very interested in creativity, building things. I really became very conscious about my impact of this whole year of yoga, et cetera. What is the impact of my life? And I was like, you know, here I'm doing snacks and uh, this is not a, a life of impact. So then I left craft and I pursued full-time writing. So I'd written the third novel. I was publishing it and I started to write another novel with this interest of like becoming a full-time writer to write things that have impact in the world. 
Then I started becoming attuned to this 4% number that I saw the third novel, which was being published worldwide for the first time. I gave it my all to market it, etc. I thought I would make it a breakout success so that I could earn enough to really, I would say, uh, become financially dependent. But then it didn't happen in the writing. So I knew I would join, I would uh, like start something again in a way. I dabbled a little bit with all this lifestyle entrepreneurship because I'd read about it from the Tim Ferriss 4-Hour Workweek book and all that. I started a small online business with like, you know, online courses, etc. But again, I thought that wouldn't scale to the extent that I wanted to with the 4% rule in mind. So then I knew I had to take up a job again. I was always pulled back to India. So I had like, you saw the discovery head role. And at the same time, I had the Uber marketing head role, discovery head role and Amazon marketing head role. I think all three of them happened in India at the same time. I chose Discovery because it would be my first, I would say, full organization CEO role. But even when I joined Discovery, I had this thing at the back of my mind that this is not the path to financial independence. I'll run into the same problem again. I'll work for a few years, get restless, you know, like uh, take some sabbatical, then want to knock back again. It'll get harder and harder at age 45 and 50 to do that. So financial independence became actually an enduring part of my life, you know, uh, after that. Yeah. So for financial independence, again, I think it's been a seven-year journey. First, I wrote a book like with the intention of being financially independent through that didn't work out did a lot of online courses etc with this lifestyle entrepreneurship in mind didn't work out you were the instructor or what yeah yeah. so the online course model i'd read a lot through all these online things that uh, look you take your subject of expertise for example writing you create a course on how to write a great book how to write a bestseller how to get published and then the marginal cost of replicating that course is zero right you just create a course and then you basically set up a architecture with Google ads, Facebook ads, etc. that it becomes a self-fulfilling thing, right? You're spending $1 on the ads and $2 on uh, like getting $2 through the course. And that becomes a self-sustaining annual income. But the reality of it is not that at all. There is nothing called online. I, I dabbled with it for all, almost a year. And I realized that this is like, uh, this is nothing. This is just people, people in the internet are giving advice on how to make money in order to make money themselves, which is a uh, like a, a paradox. Uh, so so you have to ignore all that. This is not the way to make money. And I realized that, look, money follows a very simple mathematical formula, right? It's magnitude multiplied by impact. If you impact a lot of people and you impact them really deeply, you'll make a lot of money. And uh, if you're just doing something passively online, you are either not going to have a very deep impact or you're going to have a very limited magnitude, a, a lesser number of people you will touch or you won't touch them very deeply. Discovery really spoke to me it was everything that I dreamt of. It was creativity. It was business. It was impact. I really thought Discovery was very impactful. And uh, it was about leading a team towards a common mission. India Discovery, till that point of time, had been a reasonably, you know, a stable organization. And their mandate was to shake it aim for making it a top media organization in the country. So it really spoke to me at every level. And I just jumped on it. Yeah. So how did you shake up Discovery? So I, so with Discovery, it was the same paradigm. I jumped into it. I realized that what was happening was that Discovery was, because of the foreign English content, was appealing to, in India, it's a very clear pyramid. There are 2% of people who, like, for example, India internet viewership is less than 2% in, in uh, English. 70% is seventy percent of it is in Hindi. And the remaining is in regional languages, Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, like the South Indian languages forming the bulk of it, right? So very similar. TV viewership in India, very similar. Market share of English channels is about 5 to 6%. Uh, 70% is Hindi channels and the remaining uh, 24% is uh, regional channels. So I realized very quickly that, look, if you don't do original Hindi content, and I tried to figure out how to make that happen in a structurally, financially solid model where you can combine entertainment and meaning, which has been, again, a common philosophy for me in all of my work, that you have to combine entertainment and meaning. So discovery is purposeful content. But delivered in an entertaining package is what is going to appeal to the masses, right? Similar, I think, what I learned in my writing, that you have to do entertainment and meaning, combine entertainment and meaning in every piece of work that you do creatively. So with that in mind, I did a original content strategy for discovery, which would combine entertainment and meeting, purposeful stories, uh, and uh, combined in an entertaining way. But it did not work. Uh, but I, I reinvented the kids' channel accordingly. That did really well, went from number 10 to number three, did a lot of work with the local channel, with military content, did a lot of military content on the local Discovery Channel, Hindi content, because that did very well. So some portions worked, but the big bets I took didn't work. But again, it was very principled. I was, I was following a mission of combining entertainment and meaning for the masses. I launched a TV channel called Discovery Jeet, which didn't work at all. And yeah, after, like I would say, very honest effort for three years, I just felt like I had given my best. What were your 
uh, what were your learnings in terms of like things which work, things which did not work? Okay, the two learnings I think I took away from that one. One was a very big cultural difference in the US, which I'd spent now a bulk of my career in. I'd moved uh, for Procter & Gamble in 2006. So 2006 to 16 was in the US and then 2002 to 6 was in India and then again. One big learning I took away was that in India, you have to get into the details as a leader. So in the US, you automatically, almost you will disrespect leaders who are into the details because that culture fosters independence and challenging authority. In India, if you are not into the details and you are too empowering, people will treat that as a sign that you are, you don't care about the details or you are somewhat of a weak leader, right? So one big learning was that I have to go completely into the details. I think a lot of the strategies in discovery were sensible, but uh, the execution was weak because as a leader, I was not at the, like at my peak into the details, right? I think that was one big learning uh, from the... Essentially, like in Indian companies are not inherently quality conscious. So if you really want to create high quality products, you have to go... Uh, like, not right to the details. One, and that as a leader, you know, it's, it's okay. Like, I think there's nothing wrong with that. I don't think India is any inferior for that. But as a leader, the expectation is that you set the agenda, you are directive and you are... Uh, going into the details and you are kind of constantly, constantly questioning the details, which I was not doing in discovery, if I were to be very honest, right? So that was one. I think the second learning that I took away was that if you are a new entrant, your product has to be 10, 10x better than the existing players in the market. Again, very clear that, uh, so when I launched discovery, I think the kids content was 10 times better. It did well. The mass market content was, I would say 2x maybe, or one and a half x, but not 10x. And as an entrenched if you're breaking the entrenched player cycle, then you have to be 10 times better. I think that was the other good learning. I came to Whitehead Junior with this very clear, I was just very uh, sad after the discovery experience, really. Like, so there were two, no, not just discovery. I think there were two back-to-back -back failures. I'd spent five years writing my novel, which didn't do well because it was too niche. That was the, like, I, I was talking about spiritual enlightenment, etc. So my learning to discovery was that I had to do mass I have to touch masses, right? A magnitude uh, multiplied by depth. You have to ch touch the masses at magnitude. Didn't work because I was not into the details. So I've invited Junior when I came. I was really, I would say, it took a lot to take that leap again, saying that, look, I, I have the confidence that I'll be able to build something again, which will work this time. After two kind of back to back, I would say, again, failure is a relative context. I was discovery CEO. I was like published by a top publishing house. So I can't say I was like, feeling too much like a failure, but I was feeling that I wasn't reaching my potential because I was missing something. Quite originally, I just dug in. I was like, I have to create a 10x product. So I was so austere with my team that the venture capitalists at that point of time, they were shocked, right? They were like, you were a discovery CEO. We bet on you. We bet on you on the assumption that you'll scale very fast. But for seven months, I had $1.3 million, but then my cash fund was like limited to five lakhs a month. I, I just did not let go until I had a, what I felt was a 10x superior product. I had this very strong metric that I had defined based on my business model, 50, 50, 50, that my net promoter score has to hit 50. My renewal rates have to hit 50. We kind of like uh, skipped a yeah, step. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to understand how that trigger for White Hat came about. Why did you feel that this is what I want to do? What was the... Yeah gap you identified yeah, like you know happened, that... yeah. the, uh, like two things happened one was basically as i said i knew ownership was very important to me for seven years i was trying to figure out this ownership paradigm right so i knew i would do a tech startup that was clear for me and so even during the discovery last phases i tried to figure out what would i do in a tech startup in in that phase again as i said that savana manana nididhana reading reflection experiential phase happened i read everything about tech that time so all the books that were coming out about tech, I would research Indian unicorns, Chinese unicorns, all the books. And I started to form a thesis on what ideas would work. And I'd kind of identified, I'd shortlisted four ideas. One was a AI health tech thing where I would map all the genes of India, gene data of India, create AI models and create preventive models around that. So I was interested in that idea. So there were like three, four ideas like that I'd mapped out. And it was one of that ideas. I felt again that because I read these books, like the fourth wave, et cetera, which is that the or third wave, whatever, like uh, that the idea that, uh, like, you know, our kids would grow up in a completely different world. In that world, anything that is uh, mechanical will be automated. Much of the jobs that we see around us are going to be done through data and automation, right? Even the jobs that I was doing, like even 50% um, of the discovery CEO job could be automated. I could see it in front of me because it was really making insightful judgment on data that I could see uh, tech do. So I felt like our kids would grow up in a very different world and they were not being prepared at all for that world because the whole world would be about 
your ability to do critical thinking, creativity, abstract thinking, that will become the currency of the future because everything mechanized would be automated. And when my kids were just entering the school system, they were age uh, four and two at that point of time. And I could see that nothing had changed from the time I was a student 20 years ago, while the skills of the future will be completely different. So I got excited about that idea that about creating a company that would be about creativity. And then I looked at the Indian ed tech space, even the US ed tech space, Chinese ed tech space, everything was about the left brain, right? So people were creating better and better models to teach maths and STEM and getting into IIT. So I felt that the right brain space was completely empty, very necessary. And I would have to wake parents up to that, right? Because obviously the conventional wisdom would be ki India make ki agar tum creativity bech ho, nobody will buy it, right? And I was like, look, I can create a category here. And so I was very clear that I would attack the right brain and I would go into creative, creative uh, thinking, critical thinking, because that would be the need of the future for the kids. So that's how the Vita Junior idea came. I was passionate about the idea and I then jumped into it. Why did you call it White Hat Junior? Uh, because White Hat is an ethical hacker and uh, the White Hat Junior was like a basically a fun way to say that you, like, you'll be a builder, a hacker, but a good one. My understanding is that White Hat Junior essentially was like doing coding courses, which is different from what you're telling me in terms of creativity and critical thinking. Yeah, actually, like the coding became very upfront and center, but the whole point of coding, I mean, why would you do coding at age five, right? It's not to prepare them for a career. I think the whole point of doing, uh, it was the easiest way to build things, uh, right? So any kid could learn block coding and realize the magic. And my kids were doing scratch at that point of time. So they could realize the magic of, look, I combine these four blocks and suddenly a cat emerges with meows, right? And they're very, you can see a kid's delight that I built a cat out of nothing or I built this structure out of nothing. Very similar to what you do with Lego. Here you are basically doing it in a much more, like many more combinations available and much more digital objects, many more combinations available, much more creative expanse because you're not limited to that particular infrastructure that you have. So the whole idea was that uh, coding would lead to, like the mission of the company, right, defined right at the beginning was kids uh, uh, would be built, would express their natural destiny as builders and creators. And in the original vision I presented that coding, then maths I'll teach that way, music I'll teach that way. They would learn to build and create. And that's why very critical to the thesis was active, like very creation-oriented curriculum and a live teacher to give you the feedback constantly, a feedback loop, because uh, creativity requires a feedback loop. Somebody encouraging you to build and create. What I saw with my kids is when they were doing product-only work without teacher, uh, they were very easily distracted, especially at the younger ages, below 8th grade, they're very easily distracted. So I saw that happen. So I think the live teacher uh, connection and then with the life teacher again, my mother was following my dad around in the Indian Army. Very important impact in my life because she was a Delhi University topper, very educated lady, but she could never build a career of her own because she kept following my dad around. And when I looked around me, I was like, there are so many women in India who are extremely educated, qualified, who could be great teachers for kids right now because either their husbands are their kind of primary responsibilities become a caregiver. If you're in Delhi, actually, you have no other option because your work is two hours away from your home. How will you have kids? work two hours away from home, come back every night. I saw my mother go through that same cycle. So I was like that I could create a very scalable teaching model here with all these, uh, with this very qualified untapped potential of women in India. And I think that whole uh, thing just came together with uh, Vita Junior. If you like to hear stories of founders, then we have tons of great stories from entrepreneurs who have built billion dollar businesses. Just search for the Founder Thesis Podcast on any audio streaming app like Spotify, Ghana, Apple Podcasts and subscribe to the show. How did you get it off the ground in terms of like what was version one of your product? Did you use like say a Zoom meeting and yes. just hack it together. Exactly. You're like, very, exactly. So I was very uh, clear that I would do, speed was very important to me in general. In discovery also, I was very fast. I uh, generally was in a hurry in life. I guess I was in general very hurry about everything in life in, in some sense. So speed was very important. I think what I did immediately after I got the idea was I did a zero code prototype in just two weeks. So I got Zoom. Um, then uh, there was a coding platform, Scratch. And I got a teacher in Bombay, I created six classes with her within two weeks, advertised, or not even advertised, just put it on my own Facebook group that there's free coding trial classes. Your kid will be a creator, actually very similar to how we scale. And within two weeks, I set that framework up and we did free trial classes for 30 kids, out of which one kid became a paying customer. 
right? Uh, that all happened within a four week period with no, uh, with almost like less than thousand dollars to just to put the website up. I got an upwork designer to do it. And the moment I got the first paying customer, I was like, look, I can create a category here. I just have to scale this process at a large scale. Then uh, so while you were at Discovery? Or I, I gave my notice to Discovery because I knew I would do a tech startup. So I didn't want to be unfair and like first figure out my idea. I uh, gave my notice to Discovery in July. Did this zero code prototype. A six month notice period with Discovery. So during that period, I did the zero code prototype uh, in August. Uh, while working full time with Discovery with full kind of responsibility. Then I did a zero code prototype in August and got my first paying customer. After that, I really kind of doubled down. I said, I'm going to kind of scale this. I took the results of the zero code prototype and my vision and presented it to venture capitalists. So I contacted the top 30 venture capitalists of India. I like made a list, contacted each of them. Couldn't buy LinkedIn. I didn't use any of my networks, etc. And I pitched to, I think, five of them. Sequoia, Matrix, Nexus, whoever had expressed interest. And I think Nexus and Omidyar came in very quickly. So by October, they had given me confirmation that they would fund me. Uh, in turn, I was building up my team anyway. And by November 14th, I think the company was registered. November 2018, the company was registered. And I, and the first version of the product in market was launched in November. 14 was deliberate, like, because it's still really no, 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 it just happened. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was a happy coincidence. So November 14th is November. Uh, yeah, so that's when I, the company got registered. And we launched the first version of the product, I think, November 27th or December 1st, something like that. We followed pretty much the same cycle. And uh, first month, I think December, the sales were like four lakhs or five lakhs a month, which gave me a confidence that, look, I have a very clear revenue model here. The supply side is scalable with teachers because of the kind of hugely qualified Indian women. But demand side, people want to try. Uh, what I realized was that there was this disorganized hobby space in India where uh, people were like going after chess classes or ballet classes. None of them were done in an organized fashion here. I could like really organize this disorganized creative space of India. And uh, that's how we uh, like uh, started the first version of the product came out in December, even two weeks after the company officially formed because we were working in parallel. And then I think after that, I, j I just like was very disciplined till I hit my metrics, this 50, 50, 50 rule that I had for me, uh, net promoter score being 50, renewal rates being 50 and like the, what was the other 50%, like the something other, the third thing was 50%. I, I had this very strong rule that I should hit this 50, 50, 50 mark. Till then, we kept a very small team. I had only a nine-member founding team. One was like five lakhs a month. I kept five lakhs a month for seven months. The VCs would be very stunned, right? Ki das karo race kar hai. Why are you not spending? Why are you not building the team? I was very clear, ki, based on the discovery experience, that the product doesn't hit that 10x point as measured by very quantifiable attributes that the renewal rate is 50%, net promoter score is 50%. I won't scale. So then I was very disciplined about that. Net promoter score went from uh, 13 to 23 to 35 to 50. And when it hit 50, renewal rates hit 50%. Then I, I referral, referral revenue was the third one. Then my referral should be 50% of the revenue. So again, that led to very good discipline in the company because then at 10x product point, I hit, uh, started scaling. So you were pitching a tech startup, but you were not, I mean, you were not a tech guy. I didn't like, you face that issue of that, who's your tech co-founder, who's your CTO? Yeah, like. yeah absolutely. So Nexus, uh, who put the first check, Matrix, they, they were very interested in funding me, really. I think they're my background. I was also quite transparent with them about what I'd failed within Discovery, what I'd learned. They liked that transparency. Actually, surprisingly, you know, venture capitalists liked the transparency. I was clear that, look, I'm kind of bitten now. I'm just going to have to make this work, right? I'm not going to fail a third time now after... And I told them that I was not into the details. I'm going to be very into the details. My energy and my passion to make it work. And they have the same question that I'd never done tech before. So I, I think there's no easy answer to that. But I, I actually think uh, your bets at my stage of life, your best to start without a co-founder. If I were to do it in retrospect, I would do the same thing again. I was 40 years old. I'd lost touch with my, like, you know, I wasn't connected with the a circle of people who were in tech. The act of finding somebody who's a co-founder who's passionate about your idea who's going to leave everything behind to do it at that moment of time. It's going to be almost like, a, that's going to be a needle in a haystack. So I told, so I did LinkedIn postings for my thing. I wrote very big and obvious postings about in my LinkedIn job uh, posting around that we are going to create this like massive, great company. I had a lot of tech people apply and I was very clear that I won't look for a CTO through that. I would look for a VP engineering. I found a guy who was a hacker from eighth grade. And then I presented them to the VCs. But at that time, they were already inclined to fund. I think that allowed them to close the deal. And my founding team principle was this uh, hacker, designer, marketer. You should have three kind of uh, roles in a founding team. 
uh, the VP engineering I found as a hacker. The designer were the three curriculum creators and uh, one marketer who did Facebook Google testing quickly to test what the message is. And I took this founding team to the venture capitalist. There are like seven people, the hacker, designer, marketer. And uh, yeah, and I think they like, uh, like that happened quickly. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you said that there was a disorganized hobby classes market. Yes. And you were building a more organized version of that yeah. in your product. How were you organizing it? Was it like by creating lesson plans yeah. uh, and like you teach this, teach this, teach this and like creating yeah, exactly. and teachers? Uh, uh, yeah, so I think there are two, two major components to it. One major component is that there was no output, right? So uh, the hobby market had no output. IIT preparation, why IIT preparation works is that there's an output, right? And number one, like, you know, AIR rank 32 or whatever, right? So all that, that's called an extrapolate from... Uh, pre ed tech to ed tech, it's all about IIT ranking, right? So I said, look, the hobby market has no output. What, your kid goes to a ballet class. Where is the output? So here I was like, in 48 classes, your kid will build an app, right? Very clear. In eight classes, your kid will design a game. In 144 classes, your kid, kid will design a space tech simulation, right? So really early on in the thesis, output was very important. You have to give output. That was one way to organize the hobby market. Second way was uh, train the trainer. I realized that we were in basically, I was in the business of like great curriculum and great teacher training. So we, we created a very clear lesson plans and trained teachers very well, right? And the, from the early stages, that was the focus. These women that you were hiring, the, the women who were working from home, the, these were not necessarily like comp science engineers. They were like smart women with good comp skills who would learn. Yeah, so we, right from the beginning, I think what happened was we went grade 1 to 8 in the beginning. Later, we expanded grade 9 to 12 also after the company did well. But grade 1 to 8 may, grade 1 to 3, we said anybody with a, like, just a warm, strong personality, because it's all logic exercises with some kind of a logic background, math, science, BSc, etc. would work. For grade 5 to 8, we need coding background. And again, there are a lot of, like, people who had coding backgrounds in in college and, and, and in like in the returning tech. So for grade one to four, we segmented it as strong logic backgrounds. Grade five to eight would be coding backgrounds. So very, very similar even to now how we run the company. Uh, same principle. How much would these women earn? Like what was their so The great region? part is right at the beginning, they would earn about 30,000 rupees a month was what would happen right at the start because of the Indian thing. But the moment we opened up the market to the U.S., Australia, UK, their earnings could go up to 50 to 70,000 a month, which is pretty good. Based on number of hours or it's like a commitment? Uh, no, they're typical, uh, like a typical uh, number of hours. Uh, like the good thing here was that you could choose your schedule flexibly. And uh, I've got to remember now exactly like the 30,000 rupees a month was linked to about, if I'm not wrong, about I would say 30 hours a week. You would choose 30 hours a week at your convenience. Great part was that for women, they could choose it at their convenience because we have four to eight on weekdays and nine to nine on weekends. Uh, you could just choose at your will. I think the women was so important to me, this act of scaling up supply because there was a, like I, I could see obviously there was a functional imperative that they were such highly qualified women. And I really started to feel a real sense of social imperative also because we could see that the moment these women became independent, they had more and more uh, say in their lives, right? Their in-laws respected them. They could make decisions about fighting a court case on their own. There were so many stories, taking kids, kid, uh, like putting their kids who had died, Down syndrome in a special needs school. We saw all of this happen. So it became a very big social imperative for me. So I would actually give the credit of opening up the US very early. Typically Indian startups takes three to five years to open up the US after India stabilizes. I opened up the US in nine months uh, after starting the company was very driven by supply. I wanted them to have even more flexibility to teach in the night. I knew they were qualified enough to teach the world. I had very strong conviction. And I think, again, a lot of experiences that you don't realize all these backpacking years. I was very convinced that somebody in Mongolia, Hungary, Poland, US, they're all the same, right? My wife is American. She's not Indian. I think all of this was very, I was very clear. Okay, look, an Indian company, I'm going to do it. I'm going to like scale outside India. So I was very confident about launching US, Brazil, Mexico, Australia, UK. I was like, look, the India, like I, I'm going to create something that's going to scale all over the world because people are more diff similar than different. And even when Chika at that time were freaking out because uh, like the general, general paradigm was that you need a lot of capital to scale in the US. But I was like, you know, it's not different than India. I need the capital that I need. I'll uh, need the same capital in the US. I'm running a cash positive model. The uh, margin that we make is higher than the customer acquisition cost. The LTV to CAC ratio was always very high for Whitehead Junior. And I'm going to use the same LTB to CAC ratio in the US. So I launched uh, 
I made one point three million dollars. I launched in the U.S. Right, so I was not because I think the women really like the feeling that they would have even more flexibility. They would make more money because of the night shift and stuff, and uh, pricing in the U.S. would allow uh, like even better talent to come in. Uh, so I think the virtual cycle started that way. So opening in the U.S. means what? Did you have to create an entity there and then do that, or just sitting in India, you just have to? Start accepting dollar payments, but everything uh, else. Combination of the two, you had to create an entity there, which every nobody wanted to create. I mean, I wanted to, I had to push the investors to create, but we had to create an entity there, and then everything else we did from India, which is uh, sales was from India, teachers were from India, and uh, in Brazil and Mexico, though we had to create completely local operations because the teachers were also local from Brazil and Mexico because the whole thing was uh, you need the language. Spanish, you know. It's correct. It was local. Everything had to be translated and created in local language. Yeah. So, like nine, nine months after launching, you uh, went into US, like correct. that early. Correct. Yeah, because I stabilized the product. I even though I, 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 I think nine months was also too late. To be honest, like I think there's some kind of I don't know inferiority complex that look an MVP like stabilize the MVP, make it into a finished product in India, then go to the US. But actually, the US consumer is equally open to an MVP, right? You do an MVP, you learn a lot from that MVP, you make it better. So I like we waited almost a year, but I would have like a. Done it again, I would probably do it right at the start. I had a global company thesis in mind. Now, you could argue that $1.3 million seed funding is too low to diversify across so many markets, which is true. So I think like $1.3 million really, I would say about being nine months, I would rather say that I spent nine months just building the product. And in that period of time, I was using a market as a test mechanism for the product and I wasn't scaling. The moment we started to scale, I launched the US quite quickly after. How, how do you measure NPS, Net Promoter? It was very, very like, regular. Was there a feed? Uh, yeah, very hard measure. I would say every month we would do a survey with that very simple question on how likely are you to recommend it to a friend. Nine and ten was one, eight, seven was zero, less than seven was minus one. No kind of fiddling with the numbers because it was not for investors, it was for myself. Uh, and I was rigorous that till the NPS hit 50 on a large scale, I would not scale. And, and I think that was very helpful uh, because. And referral revenue being 50% of the total revenue and renewal rates being 50%. All three had to hit 50, 50, 50. Till then I won't scale. And they were, uh, you know, I was very patient. Till then. How did you track that this is referral revenue? A referral revenue was basically like we knew, no? He, who was coming from a referral link. Uh, yeah, so the, there was a referral link and we had a pretty good, good tracking on that, yeah. So people were incentivized? like Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. So uh, we, we did a lot of referral programs right at the beginning. We did that you would get one space tech class free. Uh, that didn't work. Then we, we did, you would get one class free. That quite didn't work. Then we would do for every five referrals, you would get a MacBook. So we we kept experimenting with referral programs and the scale. It was very important right in the thesis of the company that 50% of the revenue should be like, should be referral enough that people are A, passionate about the product, proud enough about using the product that they're telling other people. And 50% and of the acquisition cost will be zero, really, right? That allowed me to spend 50% on other experiments, so Facebook, Google TV, et cetera. And so I think I was very clear that I, till that 50, 50, so, so in the beginning, actually reference revenue always did well for us. Uh, it hit 50% very quickly. NPS took a while to hit 50 and renewal rates uh, were 10% in the beginning. Then we understood that we had to add a lot of quizzes and projects after class in order to get the users to renew, to, to engage with the course. Sense of achievement. Uh, sense of achievement. And like in Facebook is a multi-billion dollar company because people use it seven times a day. If Whitehead Junior coding classes were being used two times a week, then the frequency of attraction was not enough for it to become a habit. So quizzes, projects, etc. cetera, it, it had them learn deeply. It built a habit around the product. So we did that. Then the renewal rate started to go up. And at 50, at 50, 50, so I think the startup model for me was extreme patience in the beginning, uh, learning from the discovery days. And then extreme uh, impatience after you hit that uh, scaling point. So then the moment that hit 50, 50, 50, I became a different person altogether. Then I was like, we are going to blitz scale, you know. What was your revenue when you hit 50, 50, 50? One, 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 one crore a month, $150,000 a month. And I think then I was at seed funding. Then around, at around 50 lakhs, I, uh, we were starting to hit that 50, 50, 50 point. Then we did one crore a month. Yeah. Yeah. Which month? When was Yeah, really, really. So November 2018, uh, we were zero. I started the company. I think May 2019, uh, seven months later, we hit... One crore a month for the first time. They replicated that in June and July. May, June, July was one crore a month consistently. Then that's when I picked up the Series A funding very confidently. Until then, I actually didn't want to pick up funding also. I just wanted to make sure. The moment I hit one crore a month and I got C uh, Series A funding within a week actually. 
See, the good part is that if you're very tight about your metrics, when I presented the story, I was very clear. Look, this is how we are going to build this category. These are the metrics I'm tracking. So when they called the users, the users were raving about the product. And I got Series A funding of $10 million. I think within a week, I, I think I got confirmation for that, right? And uh, I had multiple offers at that time. I think Matrix, if I'm not wrong, Matrix jumped in. Chinese investors, et cetera, jumped in. So Nexus wanted to double down. So I had like a problem of plenty because again, the metrics were unbelievably good. And they, they like, yeah, they, the cash was very less because I'd been very disciplined. I had a team of 19 or 20 by that point of time. And the team company was scaling and they could see what I was trying to do. Uh, so then I like, yeah, so I think I was very patient as a result of that. The funding came Funding the back in September. After that, I really built systems to scale. I was very convinced that I were, that we would create a hundred million dollar company. I built systems to scale. So it was from September to January, I think I spent uh, a lot of time building systems to scale, Salesforce, Zendesk, data, re-engineering the tech completely. CTO, I hired that point of time to, because I wanted to build a stable database to scale globally. And tell me about each of these pieces. Na? The, what are the pieces you need to put in place to scale? Yeah, like, yeah. I think three things overall. Yeah, three things overall. One is very strong data flowing through the whole organization. So you have to move from Google Sheet to systems. So at that type of time, I institutionalized this daily management meeting at 10 a.m., which is an enduring legacy of the company for years now. All of the top management every day, Monday to Saturday, without fails, meets at 10 a.m. and reviews the data of the previous day. How many trials happened? How many conversion, what conversion happened? What was the renewal rates? Every metric is reviewed at on a daily basis. So you have to have the data flowing into the system in order to be able to do that and make immediate corrections. I think first is data. Second is system. And Salesforce is a way to get data or like Salesforce is, I think most importantly is that your database should be strong and stable enough for the right data to flow. And it should be connected to all of the systems, which is the next point, which is uh, systems, right? So systems is. For sales, there's like, I think there are three kinds of systems, right? One is basically pre-sales system, which is typically your calling to the user, warm, like warming up a lead, etc. Even like your campaign? I think systems, yeah. Like, so I think uh, both of were quite strong, Facebook, Google, etc. But yeah, those linking to that. All that is like your pre-sales pre systems. Yeah. So I would say pre-sales, like, you know, like uh, UTM tracking, etc. Everything linking back to the database. So pre-sales systems, uh, call, call center to, to kind of warm up a lead. Then the sales system has to be very strong for us. It was Salesforce and then calling through the Salesforce, Zendesk and Exotel and uh, TalkDesk. Uh, you know, they, they use that for India Exotel and for outside India, TalkDesk to link it to Salesforce to make sure that every call is being tracked. Because in the early days of the company, till we were one crore of revenue, the founder's energy is every ever present in the organization. The organization is very competitive. So everybody's focused on just output. And you just track out, take it sale you are, 8 crore, 20 line, 50 lakhs, because that's output focus. Hota hai. Then when you start scaling, focus has to shift from output to input, which is call duration, length of call, call type, call duration, number of calls per lead, because you, are, you get a broader set of team that you have to track on input as much as you track them on output. So uh, I think that too, there was the uh, sales system and then post-sales systems of customer support, we installed Zendesk and uh, make sure that every call was recorded. And so, so, so the second kind of, so there's data, then there is systems and third is organizational structure, which I think is very important for scaling that you have very clear organizational structure. So I had very strong rules that everybody would uh, have eight to 12 direct reports, not more than that, no more than 12 direct reports, eight. So that led to very strong middle management layer hiring. Senior managers would never have more than eight to 12 direct reports. Then I would create legends within the organization, which is uh, the whole company would operate on meritocratic, very fast promotions, right? So a sales guy would could go from sales manager to VP within 18 months. So he would go, go from sales manager to team leader to director to VP within 18 months, as long as with only one parameter, that is your output performance. When you say you would create legends, that means like you would create these examples. Examples will only have great legends means that the whole company would be characterized by super fast promotions if you do if you did well. So it was basically like, you know, te like basically what I always used to say, like, look, the Vita Junior early days were at least 10, 10, 6. We would work 10 to 10, 6 days a week, right? Uh, I was very clear at that. Look, I'm, because we are going to compress 20 years of work in four years, right? I, I used to call this a 24 principle. Say that in orientation. You look at the 20 years of low intensity work is what you do in a property. That's a choice. I will compress 20 years of low intensity work into four years, right? So you'll obviously, the burden on you will be very high. The company will be very driven, aggressive. But in return for this 24 uh, principle, I'm going to give you uh, 
10 years of growth in one year, right? Like, so the 20 years of like going from manager to VP, which is what we experienced, I'm going to do that all in four years, right? So you'll go, your journey will be from sales manager to VP in four years. And so this is the principle which we'll work. And the team was, I would say, every bit, we collected a certain level of people who were doing, who wanted that. They wanted to compress 20 years of work in four years. Like they worked with me, this 10, 10, 6 rule. I was like a very high energy and like I would be, I would come to office at like 9, 30 AM and I would stay till like 11. Like I just, I just like it. Like I was, as I said, I had to work in obsessive periods of time and they, and I was very committed that people are getting so much. I have to give them a, a, that in return. ESOPs were very generous in the company uh, for that time. Now, thankfully, everybody in India's startups are getting generous. But I, right off the gate, I diluted 21% of the company, I think, versus uh, everybody was advising me to do 10%. Even VCs were saying that's too much dilution for ESOPs. But I was very, everybody had ESOPs in the company. And those who didn't have ESOPs were promoted very fast if they did well. And I think that's very important to set up as a frame. So I think September to January, I did all of these things. I said very cautiously, I did uh, systems, et cetera. February, I, then I started to really press the And button. what was your revenue uh, uh, by Jan Feb? One crore to first move get about it. Well, no, no. Uh, so, uh, we were growing very healthily about 30, 30 to 40% a month. So very healthy growth. So one to 1. 1.5 to 2, 3, 4. Then I think February hit and I said, basically, we'll double every month. Uh, right. So we said that we'll just double every month because it was just like like systems were uh, set up for scale. And then I think we just went crazy, I would say. Like, so basically, I think February, if I'm not wrong, March, we hit our first million dollar month, one million dollars in March. Uh, and then after that, April was two million dollars, May was eight, then 16, 32, 64, going up to 127 million dollars. Uh, uh, sorry, 127 crores a month. Sorry, I'm wrong. Uh, like, uh, Sorry, crore, sorry, 6 crore to 12 crore, 12 to 24, 24 to 48, 96, uh, 127 crores a month in July or August. Every month we doubled after that because systems were responding. Like again, we made a lot of mistakes. I should have done some things differently, but overall, like overall, I think we were delivering the product at scale with the promise the whole engine was working. And, and the pandemic also obviously helped at tech. I have to give credit to that. I can't claim credit to all the pandemic helped at tech and I was... Just very fortunate, right? When I blitz scaled, I doubled in February, doubled in March, April, everybody went on lockdown. I don't know if I would have been able to double every month, but after the, but the lockdown, I doubled every month. I uh, opened up in new countries. So, so yeah, we went to like basically $150 million kind of run rate from like a $12 million run rate in March to $150 million run rate in August or July at the time of the acquisition. Yeah. And, and cash flow positive. So I think that was very important to me because uh, overall the company had picked up $11.3 million. And at the time of the Beju's acquisition, we had $14 million of cash in the bank. Uh, so we hadn't touched the cash, obviously used the cash, but then uh, we were cash flow positive. So at the time of the acquisition, we were $14 million cash in the bank. But like I never, I never not used a dollar, right? Because I was very disciplined on the economics, uh, very disciplined on 50% of revenue coming from referrals. Renewal rates were very high. All of those things, all of those early decisions came in great use later when you scaled because otherwise you would have just burnt a hole with scaling. So, you know, if you look at the organization as like plumbing, essentially delivering value and money. So, so what taps do you turn to blitz scale to double growth? Is it that you turn the tap of uh, your Facebook and Google campaigns, like you start spending more money there and then that once you open that tab, then everything else also open. Like, like how, 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 what, tab, what, what switch did you turn? Yeah, as I said, the first thing is that the water in the pump has to be very good, right? So that's why you spend your time, like the first six, as I said, I had an 18 month journey. First six months was making sure that the water was very good and being very disciplined of not setting up pipes till the water is good. Next six months was setting the pipe. After that was basically opening up the faucet completely. Opening up the faucet, as I said, if 50% of the revenue is coming from referral, your task becomes easier. Because almost out of the 127 crores a month, 80 crores came from referral, right? So uh, much easier task than trying to acquire everything. The remaining 50%, I think there are, I would say, uh, there is paid lever and then there is organic lever. The paid lever is Facebook works. Uh, for me, at least Facebook and TV worked very well. Television, the moment I, around that time, I opened up television. Television and Facebook in India were great acquisition mechanisms. And the other 50%, I would say, is you're very good at the organic growth hacking. I used to be a discipline of, I'd read a lot about growth hacking, Sean Ellis, Andrew Chen, I was on top of everything. So we would have a lot of like growth devices built into the product, which is uh, every time you signed up for a trial class, you would get a certificate after that that you could share. 
And then, uh, like, so there were a lot of like, uh, ev at every touch point, we would think about how can you share this experience? How can you share this experience? And people would come from us uh, sharing that experience. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I want to ask more on both of these things, yeah. TV and organic yeah. growth hacking. TV is fairly unusual for like a one year old yeah. startup, yeah. right? But but uh, I guess you were comfortable because you knew from your discovery experience. We did the TV ad. It did the TV ad. It was a very bad TV ad, actually, really, that led to the that led to the whole Vita Junior like kind of backlash, right? But again, I can't regret. In, in, yeah, like, in what way was it a bad? I, I, I have not that, actually seen the TV yeah, ad. So the TV ad was, uh, I was very much say it, was, it wasn't a good ad, but because the whole, I think I just lost my way a little bit, right? I think the moment of the company was so strong that point of time. Like I really think that the first TV ad should be about the mission of the company. The mission of the company was kids should build and create. That was what was the dominant thread in the company. Every part of the company was run around that, right? Without an exception, even sales guys would never call and say, they would always call and say that your kid will be a builder and a creator for life. It was so strong, my training, et cetera. That, but the first TV ad was about build an app, make millions. They were very uh, offensive as a kid, right? So I think that led to the, like started the whole white edging backlash, which was uh, well-deserved, I think, for. But then, so, yeah, so I think you should, but anyway, the point is that even the bad TV ad had very good ROI. You know, I could see the results and then we made better TV ads and uh, TV has been a bit. Which channels did you use? Like, yeah, you know, in the beginning, I mean, like again, I tested everything. So we saw infotainment, English channels perform well. So we obviously had limited budgets at that point of time before the acquisition. And we did those you know, infotainment channels. Later, I saw GEC, regional, everything do well. But TV is a very good source of acquisition in India. TV is a performance medium as much as it's a branding medium, which is unusual for any other country. In India, TV is a performance medium as much as it's a branding medium. Yeah. But why do you say that? I mean, the, uh, I have never heard any founder say that TV is a performance medium. TV is a performance medium like, because it's of a very strong call to action, which is in our case, book a free trial class. We saw that the CPA or the cost per uh, trial was similar or lower than digital. So it's a, it, was, it was acting like a performance medium for us. And, uh, also along with being a branding medium, which is... Uh, People got to know the Whitehead Junior brand, but it was a performance medium as well. And yes, yeah, we started TV about 15 months into the journey uh, of starting the company. And then everybody started to know the brand. Uh, yeah. How did you track? Was it like a unique number? Or was yeah, it yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we would have an attribution model that immediately five, five minutes after the ad played, what for the trials, which could be attributed to organic. And we were like, yeah, tracking it very rigorously. So we had very strong attribution to organic attribution to TV versus to all the growth hacking links versus the digital obviously had their own UTMs. So we were able to very immediately isolate the impact of per t TV by channel by ad. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how, how did you build this system of attribution? As I said, like, if you hire an expert for it? Or? Yeah. And actually, surprisingly enough, not really. There is no TV like uh, media expert. I mean, you, you, these are needle in, needle in a haystack. Right? That's like looking for a kid's UX expert or something. I think most people are... Uh, like like people who are very, I think, as I said, like I think the three questions I always used to ask in interviews was like one is what are you reading right now? People who draw a blank on that I knew would not fit into my organization because I was very hungry to learn and grow all the time. I was like, even in my kind of startup days, being, uh, I was reading all the time, right? Second question I would ask is what are your improvement areas? Again, people who were like, yo, I need to network better, etc. I would reject them because I knew like working with me is going to be like, I'm constantly like very critical of myself and like uh, I would be like, uh, so, and the third question I would always ask is what are your three references? And I would call the references myself and the references would be like, sometimes Stan K, graphic designer ke liye, discovery ka CEO call karke pooch ra ki liye, I designer. But I, I was very like, uh, like the references I would ask is, is that one person of people that you work with? So in general, my hiring, because people were typically people who were self learners, really focused on improvement. I think so as a result of that, uh, they, they weren't subject matter experts, but they built this expertise around whatever the company needed at that point of time. So that's why, um, and like, uh, yeah. So I think that's that's how they kind of, they we built these systems. This was all part of the system building phase. Yeah, uh, tell me about organic growth hacking. Yeah. What were the things that you did there, uh, just to help <laughs> people who are yeah. not from that background to understand, like someone who's building a product. What are the ways in which he can do organic growth? Yes, yeah, so the, the 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 I would say the dominant principle of organic growth hacking for us was that every moment, every touch point of the product with the user should be a moment where they can proudly share that touch point with their uh, friends, right? So if you take that principle, the moment they signed up for a trial class, they could build a website of their own. So they built a website during the, like at the moment they signed up for trial class, completely free. 
they shared that website with people, right? That they'd built their own website. Then after that, and very simple, we, we, everything had to be extremely kind of like simplicity was very key, right? Key complexity, matlao. Then after that, the moment they finished the trial class, they would get a certificate that they could share. Then once they did the classes, they could share the pro, uh, the projects that they did after class. So I think one principle was that, look, everything is a shareable moment for the user and uh, create a great enough product that they want to share it. And that, that was, I would say, one kind of like very strong principle of the organic growth hike, which helped us a lot, right? I'm very uh, conducive to principles. Second, I would say uh, setting up a growth team fast is very good, like a good product head who's heading growth. We were, I, I was like, good to set it up and a growth team and we were very dis So basically I restructured the company or restructured the company into three verticals. All three verticals had very strong leaders and very good and very important to the founder, right? So the three verticals were growth, experience, and delivery. Growth was very important to the company, all these growth hacking tips, et cetera, marketing, growth hacking. Experience was the actual experience of the class and the projects after class. And delivery was the operations. The, the LMS, the curriculum. The, the curriculum, exactly. The curriculum. Elements came into mm -hmm. delivery was actually delivering the promise to the, which is the teacher operations and the call center operator, the teacher delivering the class as well as the our support to the user uh, after class. And all three had very strong leaders. Uh, the delivery had eventually become... Where is sales? Sales, uh, Where is sales in the growth was a part of growth, right? But I, I got sales to report. Sales did report to me directly uh, because I was passionate about sales. It was part of growth, but I had both the growth head and the sales head, but sales was within the growth vertical. So I think growth experience and delivery, all three were very important priorities to the company. At every point of time, I would do updates on all three. Even our management meetings were structured as a daily management review plus uh, a growth review and experience review or delivery review every week. So revenue and cost as a percentage of revenue. And I would track it daily. Cost as a percentage of revenue was a very important metric. At no point of time would it... Cost be. is like... Uh, cost means... Uh, marketing cost, cost running capital. Yeah, marketing cost right. as a percentage of revenue. All in marketing cost as a percentage of revenue should not go beyond 35% based on the model that we had. Experience was, again, very strongly tracked in every class had a rating. So there was class ratings and then there was obviously net promoter score and renewal was also an experience metric renewal rates were also an experience metric so all of them had about three metrics each that i would like track on a daily basis never let it fall every time any time they would fall there would be a panic in the company i uh, top down there would be a panic to make sure that no metric so you said that when you become bigger you switch from tracking output to tracking input i want to understand why is that like i would have thought that tracking output is more aligned with company goal and therefore forget input. Like, I mean, see the whole work from home movement, revolution, flexi hours, all of that says, why are you tracking my inputs? Just track my outputs. And, and this is again, very counterintuitive. So I, I want to understand your yeah. thought on this. But, but see, the overall thought is that the electric chart both output and input, not just input alone at that, but input becomes incredibly important when you move from a founder led company, which is about 200, 300 people who are driven by the founder's energy and the founder's mission. The, the next set of 5,000 people who are coming, some of them obviously are driven by the mission and obviously part of the founder's role is to get people to drive to the mission, but they're also driven by the act of having a job, right? Which is a salary at the end of the month. So now when you're talking about a sales pitch, right? A sales pitch, in the beginning, I didn't need to record any call, right? Because everybody was driven by the founder's mission and you, their own, they, they believed in the mission. They would pitch the customer with that passion of the mission. Now, the later people are coming in, yeah, they feel a sense of connection to the mission overall. But now, how you pitch, the energy that you pitch, the, the, the role of tracking input is that you can make everything better uh, with proper training. So if I look at my sales training program, we had seven touch points in sales. Just to give you one example, right? The moment somebody got selected for Vita Junior, they would get a quiz, uh, they would get the pitch and the quiz before they even joined they had to answer that quiz, right? And there would be awards for people who answered the quiz well. Then they came, they would have a seven-day classroom training, very dedicated, focused seven-day classroom training. At the end of every day, there would be a quiz and a viva. And at the end of seven days, there would be a qualification viva. You couldn't call a customer until you had qualified into the viva. So that was the second touch point. Then you actually started calling angel leads or dead leads or leads who were like expired, not converted. And you had to, and you had a set of trainers who were, helping you to call these, uh, to make sure that you had a good pitch. Then you had a qualification criteria, then you kind of called. So there were seven touch points in, this, in which there was constant training and the input tracking helped us understand how to customize the, uh, improve the performance for every person. So I think the input tracking goes to 
scaling the organization where people are not just driven by the mission, they're driven by the job. And that's a healthy thing. They're driven by their job and how to help them get better at the job through tracking the input and making the input better and better. So I think everything in the company was architected towards like, like basically uh, deep training and knowing uh, the data during the input phase in order to improve the training and the system that delivers so that we could architect it to scale, right? Rather than architect it to individual people. Now the company still has to believe in the mission, et cetera. I think I, I defined the values of the company too late. Should have done that early uh, because we did all of the, because we went from 300 to 5,000 people in the pandemic, right? I didn't realize the impact of the founder's energy, right? The, the founder's presence daily in the office is very different from the remote working. I could have done a better job at scaling the organization during that point. But you know, get mistakes made. I, 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 I try to penalize myself for in action rather than action, you know, action, you'll always make mistakes. So I try to go easy on myself for mistakes made in action. There, there's a very good Machiavelli quote, right? Make mistakes of ambition, not mistakes of slot. So I'm very hard on myself for mistakes of slot, like not defining the values of the company, but I'm easy for mistakes of ambition, which is scaling the company very fast. Right? So, so I, yeah, go easy on the mistakes of slot and go hard on your, uh, like, or rather go hard on yourself on the mistakes of sloth, but go easy on yourself on the mistakes of ambition. I run like a 40% company uh, and uh, to me, val defining value sounds abstract. Like, it sounds like stuff you read in MBA, vision, vision, values. So I think what, uh, what uh, for a 300 people, you are the value. See, you are a 40% company, you are the values, what you are living every day becomes the values of the company and you don't need to define it. I actually think defining it at less than 100 is for, in a way a bit of a theoretical exercise because they see you, you are the values. You can't say meritocratic utopia or something like that and then not promote people if they're doing very well, right? So I live that, right? I promote people on the spot if they were doing well, right? So they knew it was a meritocratic utopia. At 5,000 people, they don't know. They, they've just entered the company. They're lost in the sea of the company. They don't know that this is a true meritocratic utopia. I tell them that, look, there is, this is a meritocratic utopia where if you do well, you'll be promoted within three months, six months. Legends who have been promoted in 18 months who become VPs. Like, so the values is basically like, so if I look at the Whitehead Junior values right now, they're uh, very well defined in terms of like uh, 10x thinking. Never think of small things like how does every kid learn music in the world, right? That's a Whitehead Junior kind of initiative because it's going to be 10x. Or think of meritocratic utopia here. The only thing that matters is your performance. And here is a track record of people getting promoted on performance. It holds the whole layers of the organization. How do you make values more than just words? Uh, very, very, I think there are very good systems for that, right? I think you, for us right now, like if I think of all the touch points, basically the uh, values are mentioned in every town hall once a month. Then there are group discussions at the last mile of the organization discussing the values. So we do that once a month again after the town halls where they discuss on how they can bring it to life. Third, the values are, uh, we reward values in, in everything, right? There's anonymous recognition from your peers. If you're doing very well in values, that leads to formal recognition. And then, so basically you are, like everywhere you just keep mentioning the values again and again for informal recognition, formal recognition, building it to the appraisal system, bringing, uh, that, that's how like we've done it overall. I think I could have done this much earlier and I would have had like, yeah, I would have done better overall. Yeah. So if you're scaling right now from 40 to 400, I would say do it now. <laughs> you don't need it. It's a theoretical exercise for you to realize the absence of it. There are two questions around. Let me ask this one first. So that 300 to 5,000 journey, how did you actually hire at such a large scale? I would say very strong systems. Uh, there would be like, it was a recruiting software architected to round one, round two, round three. Round one would last for 20 minutes, round, uh, round one would last for 10 minutes, round two for 20, round three for 30. We had full-time people doing R1 and R2 who were extremely solid people in the company who, who did very well in the company. So we, so the best sales managers became full-time round one, round two interviewers and we asked them to do that for the company and created a merit system for them that if they perform, uh, performance did well, they would get incentives. So we created incentives for them also. And round three had to be senior leader who had to give an allocation of their time. So again, we had uh, like created systems around that, how to architect the R1, R2, R3, so that you always got the best people into the company. Yeah, then I think, I think that's how we, like we created a recruiting engine overall. So we were able to go from 300 to 5,000 people. But again, I did a shoddy job with welcoming them once they were in the company with proper values and stuff. It was really just, you have to work very hard here. That became the dominant thought versus you're working hard for a deeper cause. You're serving kids, you're serving teachers, and you are disproportionately growing your own career. I could have done all that much better, but yeah, anyway, you know, mistakes made. Yeah. 
like you would welcome each one like 300 to 5000 in 6 months right so we were doing 150 people a week right at 150 200 people a week at some point all remotely there would be a structured orientation i would be present in the orientation in the beginning like we would have a very structured orientation could have done better though and uh, these were what like teachers or sales people uh, sales uh, people in like say uh, the learn uh, we were doing sales operations to support uh, because the live operation is very intense uh, right because uh, just think about it in a live class your microphone will break your video will break somebody has to correct it immediately so a live operation is actually quite intense so we had very good strong operations people sales people i had the 753 strategy which is uh, seven countries uh, india us uk brazil mexico australia Indonesia five courses coding maths music english and fine arts and three formats 1 to 1 1 to 4 and school b2b so we had 753 strategy so that obviously led to many permutations and combinations in the company and people were uh, like uh, hired across the gamut for that okay uh, uh, what was the split of revenue between these five courses uh, i mean most people know white hat for just coding but were the other courses so like- it's because coding was there till the acquisition we had only coding then we launched maths after the acquisition then music so it would be 60 40 60% would be coding 20 20% would be music 20% would be math so they and they're growing because they are obviously they don't have the the history of coding and then coding was such a distinct from the music is also picking up a lot because it's such a distinct promise that you can learn guitar and piano in the comfort of your home that so i think they just stood out also part of it is also just standing out and, and the distribution channels like what was the split with 50% reference very clear 50% reference i would say 30% organic 20% organic 25% organic uh, growth hacking 75% ye ho gaya 25% ke andar equal split between digital and tv 12.5% digital 12.5% tv but the 50% reference plus the 25% organic growth hacking meant that 75% of the revenue was free right amazing so then i was in okay Uh, uh, and did you uh, also do B two B? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We started B two B, and it's a long gestation period. But I think, uh, if I'm not wrong, we are in four hundred schools right now in India, and other markets are also doing B two B now uh, because we started in India. It was, it's been a so in a way, the India split for us into the first thirty million who are active on digital etc. Who are uh, like live online classes, and the next two hundred million which are gonna come into it through the physical infrastructure. of schools and yeah the company like so i, I think yeah like i think i'd always uh, planned for india to be a deep market 30 million the top 30 million which every internet company is targeting through the live online infrastructure then re- next 200 million through physical schools etc and i wanted the company to grow horizontally internationally so we are in seven countries now with pretty deep roots So uh, even the B two B remains one to one classes. No, B two B is one school with twenty kids in the uh, like twenty, thirty, forty kids in the class. It's a completely customized curriculum and product for that. Okay, okay, okay. So like uh, a school may say, okay, I want class four to learn X Y Z skills, and then you would design that curriculum, and there would be like three periods in a week, which are essentially like white hat. Oh, exactly, exactly. Yeah, got it. Okay, okay, okay. But but the the direct to consumer product is like pure one to one. There is no. There is one to four. One to four. We initiated one to four about six months before for uh, accessible price points and mass learning. So I think that happened. So as I said, it's a seven five three strategy. Seven countries, five courses, and three formats: one to one, one to four, and B two B. So we had followed the seven five three strategy, and I think the team is following it now. Obviously, the new uh, CEO is here, and like you know, they'll they'll have their own view on how to go. Okay, so now let's talk about Byju's acquisition. Yeah. So tell me about that. What made it happen? What was the trigger, and w- what were your thoughts on it? Like, see, yeah, did you? Uh, they, yeah, there are there like so. Basically, uh, we were eighteen months in or fifteen months in November two thousand eighteen when it started. I think June is when, which is Byju, but a bunch of acquisition offers came at the same time as I was raising Series B fundraising, and uh, I think there were three kind of motivators to do the acquisition. Uh, one and I, for me it was very clear decision. Everybody was uh, like, like the very the investors were very unsupportive, right? Because they thought the company was scaling so well that uh, why would you go for an acquisition at such an early stage? But for me it was very it was kind of crystal clear overall. One was basically my five minutes of fame I had gotten before with my writing and my discovery head role etc. So I wasn't looking that Karan Bajaj or Unicorn Banaya had no value in my life at all. The the act. So I was like, look, this is a company with the Everything that we are doing, they've done for seven years. They have a 
much better international presence. They've cracked fundraising. If I think of the true pure mission of why I started the company of kids being builders and creators, right? It'll be under this umbrella, it will just rapidly scale. And that's what happened because of them. We were able to do maths faster, music faster, launch into countries faster because of like, I would say, Veju and his kind of very boundaryless vision of the world, right? That was one. Second, I think in a startup, it's very hard to reach a point where acquirer, acquired and investor, all three are happy. Very, very hard, right? Typically what happens is you are at such exaggerated valuations when your company is doing well that the acquirer has to buy it at 3x the return. Like you buy a billion dollar company for $3 billion. Such a high like uh, bar for the acquired to be happy. The acquirer obviously, so that the perfect balance. Now in my case, I had raised only two rounds, seed and series A. If I think of the investors, their last, they'd come in at $6 million, right? And they were getting $300 million exit in 15 months. Another of in India, right? $6 million to $300 million in 15 months. All cash, right? No equity, et cetera, all cash. So the investors were happy. The acquirer, Belju, who was getting a hundred and hundred fifty million dollar run rate company for $300 million. Typically, people were asking for 10x the valuations. I knew I didn't live through cycles. So I was, and then from my team perspective, my perspective also, I diluted very little, right? With two rounds of funding. So I had 40% of the company, the team had really good equity, 300 million cash would be life-changing for most people, right? So I thought the trifecta, would I be able to achieve it again? Maybe, but why would I wait to achieve it again when I had this trifecta, right? So the mission was well met. The team and the, the investors were getting a good return. Uh, Beju would be happy. And the third thing was, well, personally, right? I know I'm a guy who does things with deep passion and commitment for a few years. And then I don't, like I, that doesn't mean I'm a, like any less of a person for not believing in the mission. I believed in my novels. I believed in my work. I believe in my yoga, but I just get very obsessed with things for a period of time. And then I kind of feel the restlessness to learn more, to expand my life more. So I again knew that, look, like it's a five-year journey for me. It's not, it's not by you. Like he's committed to education for the rest of his life till he's 80. And it's so admirable. And I'm my own person, but I can't like be in some way. No, I'm not, right? I just can't be right. So <laughs> I, I read some online things about like he didn't believe in the mission. Like, no, I believe in the mission deeply. I still believe in the mission deeply. I believe the people who are doing it are have more energy and better self to do it because I'm a person who's just restless for like new learnings, new kind of my mind works in better than I'm just learning new things all the time, right? So I just have to embrace that part of me and uh, drift out into the world. So. So again, I felt like I have to, I'll make this choice either now or two years later. Now it's a favorable time, time to make that choice. So it was very clear in my head. I was like, there's no question. It's a great thing for everybody involved. And why would I dilly dally? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Benji also was very clear. Like Benji also knew me well, right? He knew came at a, I'll do this for 12 to 18 months more. We were very clear about it at the beginning. So even after the acquisition, I think I just kind of gave it my all, my whole uh, life and my heart to the company. And then... And like and moved on now, you know. Yeah. Did things change after acquisition? Um, in terms of how it was running, I first took give Bajun a lot of credit. All positive, right? He, he did everything. He invested more in the company. He had a bigger ambition, a bigger vision. He's a great. Like I think he's gonna change the nature of education the world over. Even the times I got criticism myself, I didn't feel as bad as when I saw Bajun get criticism because he's actually. A true visionary. Once I, I've only worked for one visionary in my career. He's a true education visionary. Uh, so he, no, I think uh, everything was positive, but it's a bit like the ship of Theseus in a way. Uh, ship of Theseus in the sense that everything is the same, but something has changed, you know, in the soul of the thing. So I think a little bit, I felt a bit like, like I think uh, I could have had a better run with Bejus, but something did feel different. I think I would say the only big thing that felt different was I was used to the constant, like, uh, hustle to like reduce cash burn. I was very micromanagerial. Part of me became a bit more lenient, I would say. But in general, I would say 90% of things didn't change and whatever changed, changed very much for the positive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there were a bunch of controversies post-acquisition. Uh, would you like to talk about them? I sure. I would say like mistakes were made from my end. Let's put it this way, right? I think the advertising was not right. Uh, some push of the advertising. The reaction, the the criticism was also way overblown. Okay. So what next for Karan Bajaj? Um, the, the next I'm quite focused now. Uh, after this one year, I'm taking a break. Uh, after this, I want to enter, enter politics in India. 
or I want to enter politics. Uh, so I want to have a very, like I want my life to be just committed to service at a very large, use my, I guess, hopefully you'll be able to use my strengths in scaling and systems and operations and all the mistakes I made learning from those also to have a very kind of like just devote my life to be able to have a very, very large impact in the public domain. So I'm kind of preparing myself a little bit for that by uh, like reading a lot about this, uh, like formulating my views, reflecting on what I've not done. And in this period, I'm just creating some content for like everything. And I'm like, trying to be as honest as I can about what I learned and sharing that with people so that they have slightly better, like, you know, they have better scaling journeys. How do you prepare for politics? I think in summary, I'm, I'm without preparing for civil services or giving the civil services examination, I'm preparing for a civil services examination, right? So I'm reading everything about the constitution of the country or the constitution of different countries, like the political, like the, what shaped the political climate of different countries, what has been the progress since independence for India, what is, what have I learned from US politics? So in a way, I'm giving myself a, a political science course, if you will. So I'm in the reading listening phase right now, really deeply reflecting on what I want to be. And then I'm going to jump in 24 seven and Hopefully this chapter will be much longer than all my previous chapters, you know, uh, <laughs> because I think it's the, I guess it's a pinnacle now. So this is the pinnacle of my life. I don't have any more. This won't be, you know, again, getting restless after a little bit. Uh, you know, if you do think about it is that I committed to the corporate or the private sector for the first 20 years in its own way. And now I'm going to commit to the public for the next 20 years. Yeah. So will it be like an MP, MLA kind of no, thing or will it yes. be like a... And no, I, do, I don't want to support from the outside. I'm very good at, uh, I'm just really good at operations, right? I'm good at like running things. I'm not good at advising. I was not a good management consultant. I'm, I was thinking I was a better CEO, like I was into the details. So I'm very good at being a, a PNL owner and running the details. So I want to be in the inside, not the outside. Now, how do I enter, etc. That all I have to work out in the next few months. As an independent or with a party? Yeah, with a party. I want to use the party as a channel to to do things quickly. But the independence cycle, at least in my history of what I've studied in the world over, not just in India, the independence cycle is a 50 year cycle, basically 10 election, like 10 election terms, uh, five years each, right? Before you are able to do anything of scale, uh, which is good for certain people. As I said, if I'm a Beju and I have a very strong sense of that, but I also know I'm myself, I'm a tinkerer and an operator. I want to operate fast. Yeah. Uh, and do you have any thesis you'd like to share in terms of what you think is the way forward, politically speaking, for India? Like no, Very early, very early for me to have any, un, uh, very unformed, I would have very unformed thesis right now. Yeah. But generally, I, I think the idea of India is wonderful, right? Like, I think this is such a unique, I, I, there is no history at all of so many different languages, so many different linguist, linguistic and human, like physical human characteristics being different, all organized into one state. The only other example was USSR and it disintegrated. So this idea of like this multiplicity of India, which sounds like a cliche, but actually in real life, holding together since independence is unbelievable. Actually, I am really passionate about that idea in which like there is North, South, East, West with such different linguist uh, tendencies, such different physical characteristics, such different food, et cetera, all hanging together as one identity and like contributing in some way to this idea is like a philosophical like cause as much as it's a material like upliftment. I think there is a spiritual cause to this whole thing of the idea of India, which I'm very passionate about. Okay. Okay. Got it. Cool. Uh, I'd love to chat with you once you like actually get oh, into right. politics yes. and you know, <laughs> yes, as, yes, as, an, do that. as an update on the story. Yeah. So uh, what made you agree to this podcast? Uh, like, no, I, I don't know why, surprisingly, something about the way you reached out, I think. Nothing, nothing more than that. I think something about the way you express yourself, the honesty of what you said, uh, the outreach, but typically I'm just saying no to everything because I'm very introverted right now. I read a lot. I think a lot. I write and try to contribute whatever I can to the world with what I've learned. But for the most part, I'm very introverted. I'm hiking in the mountains, you know, a lot. I'm about to do the Camino de Santiago, which is the 700,000 uh, kilometer hike from, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's a wonderful thing. It's a, it's a hike from um, the Pyrenees in France, the mountains in France to a town called uh, Santiago de Compostela. The Saint, it's called the Way of St. James. It's a Catholic pilgrimage. I'm not obviously Catholic, but I'm doing it as a pilgrimage, a uh, thousand mile, thousand kilometer hike. So I'm just basically doing these the things like this, just like strengthening my self-discipline overall before I make the next move. Yeah. 
you're in that like that spiritual rejuvenation uh, spiritual rejuvenation phase and my way of spiritual rejuvenation is through like uh, hiking and writing and do my advanced yoga teacher training uh, going to do this hike uh, like uh, doing some other experiments that's all if you like the 